Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the last panel of the 2023 edition of the Roger W. Gale Symposium. The symposium is hosted by the Department of, of Economics, Philosophy, and Political Science, which is within the Irving K. Barber Faculty of Arts and Sciences. My name is Wendy Wong, and I am pleased to serve as your moderator for this session. Um, I'm a professor of political science. First, I'd like to give our land acknowledgement, I would like to respectfully acknowledge the Silex Okanagan Nation and their peoples in whose traditional, ancestral, unceded territory UBC Okanagan is situated. I would also like to acknowledge that you are joining us today from many places, near and far, and therefore would like to acknowledge the, the traditional inhabitants and caretakers of those lands. So I'm really excited to be moderating this panel because I think it's going to be answering a lot of really key questions that are, are facing us today and have been facing global politics for about a year right now, about a year um, and, and also beyond. So uh, our speakers today are gonna help us contextualize the ongoing events that have been unfolding. Some of the questions our panelists will be talking about or talking to are how best to understand the geopolitical motivations behind Russia's war in Ukraine? What is the political philosophy guiding liberal democracies political responses to such crises, whether there are any remedies that international organizations can provide to Russia's violations of international law, and finally, how humanitarian organizations might remain neutral in this war. So a lot of really pertinent and pressing questions, and I'm pleased to uh, introduce the speakers for our panel. We have three distinguished guests. First is Stephen Turner, who is Distinguished University Professor at the University of South Florida, who will be speaking to foreign policy, making foreign policy safe for democracy. We have Marco Sassoli, who is Professor of International Law at the Faculty of Law at the University of Geneva in Switzerland, who will be speaking to Western states' respect for international humanitarian law. And finally, Seva Gunitsky, who is Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Toronto, who will be speaking to in the shadow of empire recurring patterns of foreign policy. Now, this is a hybrid event. So there are people participating, as you can see online, as well as physically here in Kelowna. And so uh, I just want to take this time to say to Seva that we that we can't talk at the same time. So if you do want to jump in, please do let us know um, because of the way that the AV works in this room. So people in here and people online can't talk at the same time. Um, so each speaker is going to speak for about 30 minutes, and then we will open things up for Q&A. So I'd like to turn things over to our first speaker, actually, who is Seva Ganitsky. He will be speaking on Zoom, and um, we, we can start now. And I will give each speaker a five-minute warning and a two-minute warning at the end of their at the end of their time. So. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me to be part of this panel. And apologies, I couldn't be there in person. Uh, I'm home with my five-year-old, so you may see an intrusion on the screen from time to time. Um, I want to speak briefly about the role of empire uh, in, what's going, in what's happening today. Uh, the, the role of empire in Russian political life and perhaps even Russian mental life, since empire has now become an integral part of public discourse in Russian media and on Russian TV, which I do occasionally watch, although I don't recommend you do it very often. Uh, so the invasion of Ukraine, or really the escalation of the invasion last year, is often associated with a policy choice made by a single person, namely Vladimir Putin. And people who study the man had noticed him becoming more high-handed in his dealings, uh, perhaps more overconfident about his abilities. Uh, his inner circle had tightened, with the majority of influence now resting with the power ministries, who are prone to have a paranoid and aggressive view of the world. So Russia had become a consolidated personalist regime in which power was increasingly concentrated in a single person. And uh, while I think we can only speculate about the timing or his motives, we know that Putin spent a year in COVID isolation reading about Russian history. And we know that unconstrained autocratic power and historical delusions of grandeur are, in fact, a very bad combination. And Putin's role is central. But that's not to say the course of action he's pursuing is unique to him or historically unprecedented in some ways. I think one historical parallel to Russian foreign policy that's especially useful for us to consider is the Russian and then the Soviet foreign policy in the shaky years from 1917 to 1924, roughly from the Bolshevik coup 
1917 to the slow consolidation of Soviet power across the Tsarist Empire, which was not instantaneous, by the way. The USSR did not just emerge from the chaos. Oh, I'm so sorry. My, my kid needs something. Yeah. Yes, buddy. I will. I will. Just give me a minute. I, I can't right now. Sorry. No, I can't right now. Xander, please, can you give me a minute? Um, so anyway, uh, uh, so Putin's role is central is what I'm trying to say, but it's not unprecedented. Uh, and uh, the, those years from 1917 to 1924, I think, are a good uh, parallel uh, because the Soviet Union did not just emerge uh, instantaneously from the Tsarist collapse. The, uh, there was a, it took a few years. There was a sudden imperial collapse, the overthrow of the Romanov dynasty, and there was a loss of regional primacy that created new states along the Russian periphery. Uh, sort of a fascinating collection of now forgotten statelets and quasi-states. Uh, and back then, just as in 1991, Western observers often misinterpreted the movements that sprang from this imperial collapse as democratic or liberal revolutions rather than national liberation, liberation movements, which is what they were. And the result in both 1917 and 1991 were high hopes placed on new democracies that was followed by quick disappointment. And in both cases, as Russia recovered, it increasingly sought to recover its regional sphere of influence by reintegrating those new proto-states back into its fold through force if necessary. So between 1917 and 1922, the Red Army essentially reconquered the lost Tsarist lands. Uh, lands. Now they were doing it, of course, under the anti-imperialist banner of communism, uh, taking over the new nations that sprung along its borders, including Ukraine, by the way. And I think what we have seen since roughly 2008, since the Russia-Georgia war, is kind of a slower version of that same fitful attempt uh, to, to regather those territories. Um, uh, so collapse, imperial fragmentation, recovery, imperial expansion, decline, collapse. That's the sort of cycle that we can see here. Hold on, buddy. Just a second, please. So without ignoring the role of Putin, there's also a sort of a timeless element of Russia's foreign policy in which Putin is only the latest chapter. And that's the pursuit of great power, which is a word in Russian. That's kind of difficult to translate, but Dzerzhavnist is essentially both being a great power and being recognized as such by others. And in Russia's immediate neighborhood, that means having an unquestioned sphere of influence, uh, similar to uh, America's Monroe Doctrine. Uh, and in dealing with other powerful states like the U.S., it also implies things like respect and prestige and peer recognition all rolled into one. It's sort of a seat at the table uh, managing global affairs. That is sort of the ultimate dream of Putin and one that obviously has failed now. Uh, but this is why the Soviet collapse in the eyes of Putin and others was such a disaster. Uh, the West, uh, I would say we saw the collapse as an unalloyed good and a breakthrough for global peace. And the, the geopolitical and the ideological dimensions of the conflict were intertwined, even inseparable in Western minds. Uh, ideologically, democracy had defeated communism, and geopolitically, the international system shifted from bipolar to a unipolar system. That's sort of the traditional Western view of what happened. For Russia, however, they saw this very differently. The end of the Cold War for Russia signaled the end of two very different struggles. One was the ideological struggle of communism against democracy, uh, but two was also the end of Russian Dirjavnost, the Russian great power. And the, ide the ideological defeat was understandable and even welcome. And I think today, few people in Russia seek a return to communism. Putin is certainly no communist. I think the invasion made that clear. He explicitly repudiated Lenin in his, in his declaration of war. But the quest to restore Russia's traditional sphere of influence remains the key geopolitical imperative regardless of ideology. So bottom line, the twin vic victories of 1991 were conflated in the West, uh, but decoupled in Russia. So to Western years, uh, Putin's lament that the Soviet collapse was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century sounds like alarming nostalgia for the Cold War. But Putin here means something else. In a couple of years, the country had gone from a superpower to a joke. But you're gonna have to give me one minute, okay. So Russia is undoubtedly seeking to change the status quo in Europe. Uh, but from Putin's perspective, if I could speculate for just a second, it's the West that has disrupted the status quo for him. Uh, this abrupt expansion of Western influence since the collapse uh, is, as many Russian politicians see it, is a disruption to a centuries-long status quo that reaches back not just to Stalin, but to Peter the Great. Now, here's the essential problem, and maybe sort of the one thing I want to uh, put forward today is the essential problem is that Russia's image as a great power, as a Dirjava, something that possesses Dirjavnist, 
cannot be separated from its image as the dominant imperial power that takes other lesser nations under its wing. Uh, it can only be a superpower if it's an empire, uh, if it exercises some kind of formal dominion. Uh, and I think the notion of Russian great powerness is inseparable from its image as that big brother to other lesser nations. And that's why I put the word living in the shadow in the title of this uh, brief presentation, because it's not just the region itself that's been historically in the shadow of the Russian empire. It's also that Russian mentality itself is in that shadow. Uh, I remember on Twitter a few weeks ago, there was, a, as you know, there was a huge exodus of Russian uh, people from the country, uh, especially Russian liberals. And uh, one Russian liberal posted on Twitter something like, well, the silver lining to all this is at least wherever Russians go, they improve the situation and they uh, help improve the, the environment and, and they, they improve the infrastructure. And, you know, this is this is a person fleeing the country, right? So uh, a Russian liberal. And I, I think that mentality that Russia is sort of the core and is, is uh, the business of improving the region, I think, is is very prevalent uh, throughout the region. It's not just Putin. Um, and, you know, the, the notion here is that the ethnic Russian core is at the heart of the empire, but the empire itself is magnanimous and multicultural, contains many ethnicities. And this is why there are two different words for Russian in the Russian language, which is Ruski and Rasiski. Uh, Ruski meaning ethnically Russian, Rasiski meaning uh, politically Russian. Russian is part of a political unit. Um, and even international law, to the extent that it figures in the calculations uh, of these people at all, is subordinate to the mythos of empire. Uh, so just to give you one brief example, which I'm sure you're aware of, Russian forces have kidnapped and resettled thousands of Ukrainian children in direct violation of the Genocide Convention. Is this something they cover up in the Russian media? I mean, they could easily, given the control the regime has, but no, they don't. What really takes the child kidnappings to an insane level is the Russian media repeatedly broadcasting and framing these kidnappings as heartwarming stories of rescue and redemption, which implies that there are TV editors counting on millions of ordinary people to watch an act that literally violates the genocide convention and go, are we not great? Are we not magnanimous? And I think possibly the surest sign of a deep imperial mentality is the belief that your imperialism is axiomatically benevolent, which is, by the way, uh, a belief that's shared not just by Russia, but by other states. Uh, and I think defeat in Ukraine would be one step toward dismantling that imperial mentality that I would say is still very per pervasive in Russia, uh, but there is still a long way to go. And I'll conclude here because I thought we would only speak for 10 or 15 minutes and leave time for questions. Uh, thank you very much. I, I greatly appreciate that uh, uh, discussion because I won't have to repeat uh, some of those ideas. Uh, uh, it's important to see the Russian side of this uh, story, if you, even if you don't agree with it. Um, a recent uh, big book by Henry Kissinger uh, described different, the, the five different views of international order, and the Russian one was exactly that. The idea that we're doing the same thing as the Monroe Doctrine, we're keeping foreigners from encroaching too much and uh, using these buffer states in order to do that. So you can see why Ukraine is a major problem from that point of view. Um, but what I want to talk about is something, I want to jack this up several levels of uh, abstraction and talk about the problem of foreign policy versus democracy, which is implicit in all of these discussions and is a generic problem, especially for democracies and now uh, uh, an increasingly serious problem because the whole problem of support for Ukraine as it increases creates more divisions and more conflicts um, unless there is a kind of democratic support in the nations, the many nations that are participating in this. So this is a traditional worry. Um, foreign policy was never connected up with uh, democracy. Uh, it was the domain of kings, and we still use uh, uh, monarchical notions in talking about, say, presidential authority in foreign policy. Um, and uh, foreign offices were offices of the elite. Um, everything, everyone but the people. It certainly was not democratic. As, and much of what uh, went on in these um, uh, offices uh, was either secret, uh, based on considerations that were not uh, generally made public, uh, and it was fundamentally focused on issues of balance of power, uh, which is a, essentially a moral problem, um, which um, 
um, contemporary realists like John Mersheimer uh, assume are the fundamental uh, facts of uh, geopolitics. So this wasn't such a problem in uh, uh, the early, uh, say, the 19th century or 18th century, because suffrage was not general. Uh, the, uh, the only thing that had to happen was that the gentry was included into the aristocracy. And um, the aristocracy gave its sons to imperial service and uh, uh, had a stake in empire. Uh, they were part of it, uh, and I'll come back to that issue a little later. So it wasn't a problem for the U.S. originally because from the time of Washington, the, the motto was avoid foreign entanglements. It was a big problem for democratizing European powers uh, in the age of empire. Uh, and most of what the thinking that we have on this problem really comes from that uh, period. And the problem was, how do you explain and justify war to a public that can vote on it? Uh, so suffrage uh, was the big problem. And uh, the widening of suffrage meant more votes that was, were motivated by anti-war sentiments. Uh, so there were, after both uh, world wars, there was a, a strong sense that the people had been dragged into this war, uh, had made sacrifices, and now were owed something. And the uh, First World War, it was mostly uh, suffrage. After the Second World War, it was the welfare state. Um, so this assumes a dynamic of elites, uh, elites who uh, ask people to sacrifice. And realistically, elites have goals, interests, and a shared uh, mentality that differs from and is uh, often in contempt of uh, the ordinary people that elites depend on. And this is especially true with respect to uh, war. So that, that provides the sort of the political basis of the conflict between uh, uh, foreign policy and democracy. Um, but, uh, there's a generic thing here, which is that foreign policy involves a lot of things that don't fit with normal democratic uh, impulses. And I'm sure you've heard the phrase perfidious Albion. Uh, that was uh, uh, applied to England because uh, the English uh, constantly rearranged their alliances uh, in a completely amoral way and were, cons were considered to be uh, they were, in uh, Mersh Armour's terms, uh, offshore balancers. They, they intervened to uh, preserve the balance of power by changing sides uh, in order to uh, uh, keep the peace. But that meant that uh, there wasn't any, uh, any kind of moral justification. Nobody pretended that. Uh, this was simply a matter of power politics. Um, this is something hard to sell to uh, people whose uh, sons are being sent off to die in these uh, uh, um, activities. Then there are all these concepts like justice. Uh, there's a kind of popular conception of justice. Um, and uh, this often even con conflicts with international law, uh, particularly because international law tends to fix borders and boundaries as they are, but if people consider those borders and boundaries unjust uh, for various reasons, they uh, uh, are critical of uh, the constraints of international law. Then there's the very big fact of, uh, of secrecy. Uh, the people uh, in general don't have access to the, the information that uh, foreign offices and defense uh, uh, ministries have access to. And in, we can say, yes, this is necessary in time of war or in preparation for war, but it's a general fact about uh, um, uh, modern politics anyway. There's a conflict between uh, uh, secrecy. And basically, anytime you have uh, discretionary power in a state, it will be abused. So uh, it's not under democratic control. So that's actually one of the big themes I want to follow up on. The same thing goes with espionage and raison d'etat. The, the, the whole question of state survival is very different than national well being, and it has its own reasons, which often can't be made public. So the foreign policy is a separate uh, domain 
that is in inherent conflict with uh, uh, democracy. Then uh, there are many issues that also come up uh, that uh, have to do with the differential effect of uh, foreign policy actions on different sections of the uh, population. So foreign policy creates burdens. Uh, what if we sanction uh, somebody, somebody loses uh, domestically. Uh, who loses and uh, how much burden should they share? Uh, that's a, a, a big question. And since we're talking about an elite versus uh, uh, democratic dynamic, uh, that that takes place uh, that that creates a, a reasonable suspicions about these things so uh the result here is that there's a permanent conflict with uh, the public uh it's a complicated one the public's a heterogeneous care uh, category um but they have their own ideas about war policy and responsibility uh and the other side is also complicated. It's got different ministries with different points of view, uh, ambitions, uh, people within it with uh, uh, their own uh, ideas of what the right thing to do is. Um, and uh, it's especially important to realize that this is involves expert claims. Uh, the players here are experts. And, uh, and I have a long-term late collaborator who was uh, student at SAIS and uh, um, was, uh, that's the uh, Johns Hopkins School of uh, International Studies that produces a lot of these people. And they produce people with a very particular mindset that support each other, uh, you know, j share jobs. Uh, it's a very uh, tight and uh, um, group think oriented kind of, uh, of um, uh, group that runs actually American foreign policy. So are they really experts? Uh, well, no, uh, they screw up uh, repeatedly. And if you are um, in uh, possession of a lot of discretion as a group uh, and ha can hide behind secrecy and so on and so forth, uh, errors and abuses that are not accountable or uh, uh, bound to uh, uh, follow. Um, so that's, uh, that's the question here. How do you manage uh, the relations between this kind of group or this kind of expertise or that kind of leader and uh, democracy or the public? So I'm gonna describe three different solutions to this problem, all from Germans or German emigres, uh, because they're the ones that face this problem in the most acute way, especially at the, uh, at the end of World War I and, and at the uh, beginning of the uh, uh, Weimar Republic. Um, and then I want to end with some examples of what democratic initiatives actually look like and why they conflict so much with this. Okay, so I'm going to give you three people. Uh, start with Carl Friedrich. Um, he was uh, um, the mentor of Kissinger and Brzezinski, very central figure in at Harvard. Uh, he was the child of a um, uh, Prussian uh, um, noble family, very wealthy. It's a long uh, story. Uh, and for various reasons, he decided to uh, uh, emigrate. His brother uh, emigrated back to Germany, became a Nazi. He was uh, close to Carl Schmidt his whole life. Uh, and this is his uh, view of the proper relationship between the people and uh, the, the leader. And his position at this time, this is a, a recollection by David Easton, Canadian, uh, who um, was president of the American Political Science Association, and he went around asking people to sign a petition against the uh, Vietnam War. And Carl Friedrich said, no, uh, foreign affairs should be best left to the president, neither to Congress, he did not believe in Congress being a maker of foreign policy, nor to individual citizens. So that's a pretty extreme uh, view of the problem. It's uh, 
shut up and obey uh, view of uh, presidential authority in relation to um, uh, foreign policy. But this needs to be put in a little context. Uh, he was, uh, became famous as a defender of democracy um, in the uh, run up to World War II. Uh, he was an anti Nazi, um, but an anti Nazi of a very particular aristocratic liberal uh, type and, uh, uh, and a really authoritarian liberal type. And uh, he attacked uh, what he called the absurdities of traditional, the traditional rationalistic conception of democracy and the common man. He just didn't think people were rational, the common man was uh, particularly rational, but he wanted to somehow square this with his view of, uh, of uh, who should make decisions, who he thought uh, bureaucrats should make the decisions. And uh, so his, his version of solving the problem of democracy was that, well, we can get enough people uh, to, to, enough people can be made to see the facts in a given situation to provide a working majority for a reasonable solution. The reasonable solution comes top down, a, a, a working minor, majority is persuaded to see the facts in a particular way, and that's what you needed for democracy. Okay, so uh, he redefines representation here. It's not people who are elected to represent, but people who are somehow representative because their general outlook co coincides with that of the majority and they possess merit only in that they are represented. So the idea is that, well, people have common sense and the, the uh, bureaucrats share this common sense. They just have a lot more of it. They're a lot more rational. So the outlook, they're not in conflict really. Uh, they are just more rational and smart than uh, the public. Uh, so, and that justifies that it's calling it uh, democratic. Um, so the problem here is just a problem of uh, familiar problem of discretion. Uh, if, if in this model, they're not accountable. Uh, and uh, he liked the term responsible democracy. And this is a term that runs through actually all of these uh, uh, thinkers. For them, the important point of leadership was not conventional morality, justice, blah, blah, blah. It was the sheer fact that they were responsible for the people that they led. So his view was, we want, a democ uh, we want a bureaucracy that is itself responsible. Not accountable, as critics pointed out, but responsible, meaning they do things for the best uh, interests of the people who they are uh, governing. Well, this is especially a problem for foreign policy because it relies on trust and a lack of transparency and so on. Uh, so none of these things would work if they had to be negotiated with the public. And that's an assumption that uh, uh, makes a great deal of uh, sense. So is it really true that this bureaucratic outlook coincides with anything? No, uh, it's, it develops its own culture, has its own interests. Uh, people involved in it uh, deal more with other diplomats than with citizens and uh, if you, it was a joke about uh, Henry Kissinger that he was much more familiar with every capital in Europe than with the places like Kansas City. And in fact, he had never been to any of these, these places. He was fundamentally a global uh, uh, citizen rather than uh, anybody that was familiar at all with uh, the people he was uh, uh, representing. Um, and that's become even more obvious in uh, recent discussions because the, the people who propose big ideas in uh, uh, the global arena, they all talk to each other, they all went to school together, they share a common outlook that is far removed from uh, the general public. Um, okay, so we've seen, seen the extreme version is uh, Friedrich, uh, probably the core uh, realist thinker in the last the part of the 20th century was uh, Hans Morgenthau. And he had a very fairly well-developed uh, view of this, that the statesman was responsible uh, and uh, 
He had a job, protect the national interest. And this was a job that was well-defined by the realities of international politics. Uh, and if you deviated very much from this, you acted against the national uh, interest. It's governed by external realities, and the laws of power politics. And that means essentially uh, the balance of power. Um, so these are not uh, ambiguous demands. They require decisions constantly to respond to them. And uh, the, so the responsible leader has a job uh, apart from uh, democracy. But the democratic leader then has a special task. Can't expect people to simply defer to his decisions. Can't simply pander to public preferences where they diverge from the demands of national interests. So what do they do? Effective policy requires popular support. So the statesman must impress upon the people the requirements of a sound foreign policy by telling them the facts of political life, then strike a compromise which leaves the essence of a sound foreign policy intact. That's a tall order, uh, but essentially it means that the statesman has to deal with the public the same way they deal with, deal with the foreign power. Uh, nevertheless, uh, this gets you some kind of uh, democratic uh, input. You have to persuade the people and you have to tell them the truth about uh, politics, not about the details, but about the facts of political life. Okay, so Friedrich doesn't think you have to treat the public as an equal, they're not rational. They only need to be made to see something. For Morgenthau, the leader is an educator. He educates people in the facts of political life. Uh, and once that's done, once the parameters are set, you can make a compromise just as you would with a foreign leader. Okay, now here's a third model. This comes from uh, Max Weber. Now, Weber is earlier generation, uh, dies shortly after uh, uh, the First World War, and uh, his concerns are the concerns of an earlier generation. So he's looking at the English as the model of a successful, at least quasi-democratic, uh, foreign policy producing uh, regime. And he wants, as Germans, especially after unification uh, uh, did, they looked at England as a model of doing almost everything. So the way Weber looks at it as a model is uh, uh, you have to have citizens who understand the responsibilities of being a great power. Uh, they have to think like uh, uh, people, uh, they have to think like Bismarck, essentially. Uh, he, and he, he admired the English because he thought they, they had achieved that, that people understood the demands of empire and they uh, acted uh, accordingly. He thought the Germans were just order takers and that that wasn't sufficient for the kind of popular uh, support necessary for uh, international politics. They were simply naive about international politics and uh, they, uh, his, uh, he was not particularly a fan of Bismarck politically uh, as his father was uh, and the National Liberal Party, and he was you know, heavily involved with these people, but he's, he re respected Bismarck as one of those politicians that comes around once a millennium. And he noticed that when Bismarck was dismissed, uh, everybody just, as he said, turned to the new son. They just, uh, the, the, they didn't engage with it. They took orders. Okay, so then the, he's got faced with the problem of, well, okay, how do you get from the kind of citizens we have, or subjects in this case, to the kinds of citizens we need for democratic support of Germany, which for, from his point of view had uh, the fate of uh, be, being a great power. He said it, we couldn't Swissify, uh, we couldn't be like the Netherlands, uh, we're too big for that we have to be uh, uh, a great power in spite of the fact that we're uh, constantly being crushed between the, the uh, uh, Russians and the Anglo-Saxons, um, which is, is a traditional German way of uh, 
uh, looking at politics, which still exists, by the way. So the problem then was, how do you uh, um, get there? Well, you need political education. And political education is not something that you teach at school. Uh, you need some kind of uh, um, uh, experiential education. So uh, in American politics, as Lord Bryce said, the, the schoolhouse or the local participation is the schoolhouse of democracy. And I think this is actually very accurate that, that people uh, are engaged constantly in uh, participatory governance of things like a little league organization or a church or so forth. They get a tremendous amount of experience in how you solve problems with other people uh, politically. So by the time they run for office, they know a lot about how you do politics. Um, now, the problem is, is there a foreign policy analog to this? And uh, this is uh, Weber's solution is that, look, um, you, uh, a, a position of world power constantly feeds people with uh, the realities of the power political tasks of the day that give an individual a training, which, he, which we might call chronic. That's optimistic. He, he certainly was not a particularly optimistic guy, but he did think that uh, this had to be the way it was done. Uh, the public had to be uh, inured to the realities of imperial power projection. They had to understand what the nation had to do, what its, its uh, power political tasks were. And uh, if this is done through mythologizing and so on, uh, it won't really work. Uh, the, so the question is whether you can you can actually get this kind of uh, of uh, sensitivity, and I, I, you know, as an aside, I'm commonly uh, uh, dealing with um, German academics who should know better, and you you see an, an incredibly uh, uh, parochial attitude toward uh, German power, which at the diplomatic level is exerted very forcefully over everybody in Europe all the time. But in the public, there's almost a sense of, yes, we're, we're innocent of everything. We never do anything bad. Uh, and uh, why are people always picking on us? Um, so uh, this is a really hard thing to get to, a public that is capable of dealing with uh, its own power. OK, so we're. We're, if we look at this from the other side, the democratic side, what do people want? And i um, give, give you try to get through three examples uh, here. Um, yeah. So the first one, one was really uh, with Versailles, the, after the First World War. And uh, here we see something that, that we're seeing exactly reincarnated in the case of Putin. Everybody wanted to hang the Kaiser, or publicly they wanted to hang the Kaiser. Naturally, the, the elite thought this was ridiculous. Uh, they couldn't believe anybody was so stupid, but that was the public uh, demand. Why? Because the democratic uh, response to the war had to do with personalizing responsibility for the war, and the Kaiser was responsible, in fact, it's hard to say who was responsible, but that was the democratic uh, perception. So the public wanted the people to be who caused the war to be punished. And next step, they wanted war as a means to be permanently abolished and for the people to rule. And also, as Wilson made famous, uh, the idea that there were no more secret uh, uh, covenants. And those were very popular ideas immediately after the war. They were completely destroyed by the, the uh, Versailles negotiations uh, and uh, were maybe simply uh, utopian folly. That's what uh, Morgenthau would, would have said. Um, OK, so but the issues here are still with us. We have popular notions of justice that just don't correspond with what uh, 
the um, uh, elite uh, and foreign policy establishment uh, thinks about. So the next, the next, so this is an issue of, of uh, um, uh, Victor's justice. Uh, do we hold the Kaiser responsible or is, or is there any legal basis for this? Uh, there wasn't, but there was certainly a popular basis for it. He went into exile. He was never punished for it. And quite recently, his heirs have asked for a few of the castles back because they still uh, uh, think that, the, well, we had, they were unfairly taken away from us. Okay, the next movement was uh, called the Outlawry of War, War Movement. This was started by a Chicago lawyer, a uh, private, uh, you know, a corporate lawyer. And his, his argument was, well, let's, let's just get rid of law by outlawing it, sort of like gun control. And uh, th this is a very convoluted story because it gets picked up by politicians, it gets modified in various ways, but, the bait, and, but it was very much promoted by John Dewey. Uh, so it did uh, achieve a certain uh, respectability and it had some uh, um, effects uh, later on, on things like the Pact of Paris. But the basic ideas were renouncing international war, uh, making war dependent on democratic referenda. That's a pretty crucial, uh, um, uh, and, and making this renunciation of war also dependent on democratic referenda in each nation. Um, and, and, um, and also in international conferences on international law that would establish this, but also an absolute rejection of the practicability of sanctions. They under, understood that sanctions were essentially a form of uh, war. So this had its consequences, uh, not directly, but in Nuremberg, uh, the Pact of Paris, which was a kind of uh, um, downsized version of this idea, uh, uh, was appealed to in uh, um, punishing people for uh, aggressive wars. Problem was, there was no way to enforce it, uh, and um, the pact was between nations, the punishment was for individuals, didn't work. Um, now the final one is the, the uh, A-bomb, um, widely regarded as a war crime. Uh, it was a nice what about move for the Germans who said, gee, we were really terrible, but look at what they did. Uh, it's still intensely debated, but there was a very interesting democratic accountability element. I'll, I'll close with this. Um, when the decision was being made, um, obviously all of this stuff was secret uh, and there were a series of technical committees that were put together to provide information to the final technical committee, which would make recommendations to the president. In the final technical committee, there were um, some uh, very important uh, people, uh, including um, James Conant. And um, the, the person that you always see in, in World War II newsreels was the reedy voice, who was the uh, Secretary of State, James Byrne. And he sa said to the committee as they were deliberating, and they were deliberating in a kind of non, not concerned with uh, democratic blowback. And he said, you should realize that there will be a congressional committee reviewing this decision after the war. That iced it. They said, okay, we're not gonna go to people and say, your sons died because we refused to use this weapon. So they did it. Uh, so uh, that's uh, just a sign really of, uh, of democracy. There's one more I could go through, the Bricker Amendment, which was an attempt to uh, force um, uh, all uh, uh, international agreements to be public uh, and uh, um, consistent with the constitution uh, that was uh, blocked by uh, uh, Eisenhower. It's a long story, but it had to do with Truman's decision to prosecute the Korean War without democratic approval. So, yeah. So, the bottom line, this is a generic problem. In the case of uh, Ukraine, it's a problem of how it is that the, um, we square whatever it is that we think is uh, justifiable as a foreign policy with um, 
democratic aspirations. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen, for walking us through such a comprehensive review and, and helping us think through some of the, the ideas behind governance and, and foreign policy. Um, now I turn to Marco Sassoli, who's going to be talking about Western states' respect for international humanitarian law. Well, uh, good morning. Welcome. Many thanks to Roger Gale to have made this possible, to Manuela to have invited me and to have insisted that I come in person, and to her team to have organized this. Um, and I apologize that I will neither speak on what she announced yesterday, which is uh, the first inquiry into the respect of humanitarian law and human rights uh, in uh, the war after the all out invasion uh, of Ukraine on the 24th of February. Uh, I was a member of this commission of inquiry of the organization for security and cooperation in Europe, and we delivered the report you can find on the internet uh, of some 100 pages. <laughs> um, and I will not speak uh, or only in very part speak, sorry, uh, to what uh, our chair announced, the Western perspectives, but I will more generally speak about uh, war in public international law applied to the situation in Ukraine, but I will speak a lot about humanitarian law because the situation is much less clear than that under, under other branches of international law. So war is basically governed in international law by two totally distinct branches. One is uh, the UN Charter, or if you like Latin terms, the use ad bellum, which prohibits at the latest since 1945 to make war. Um, and uh, I think there is no doubt, no possible doubt, that Russia in international law has violated uh, this prohibition. Already in 2014, by annexing uh, Crimea, there's no possible uh, justification to annex uh, part of a neighboring country. Russia tried to justify that by making a referendum after the, um, they got control militarily without a lot of resistance by the Ukrainians over Crimea. But uh, this doesn't work in public international law, even if the referendum had been, which it was not, genuine. And the genuine majority had been in favor of joining Russia. This is not possible under international law, um, because only peoples have a right to self-determination. And the inhabitants of Crimea are not a people nor are the inhabitants of Donbass uh, a people. Ukrainians are a people, Russians are a people, and probably the Crimean Tatars are a people. Um, so, you know, to give a Canadian example, fortunately, even the most radical uh, Quebecois independentists have not suggested that first the US should invade Canada and then make a referendum in Quebec. Uh, so it really doesn't work. And it doesn't work also, and this is why I speak a little longer about it, um, for the annexation of the Donbass through uh, the so-called referendums of last year. Um, then the, uh, to, uh, obviously then, uh, still 2014, um, 
the question which is not so obvious, I was not so obvious at the time whether there was a genuine rebellion in the Donbass or all this was simply organized by Russia. Probably there was a mixture between the two and these rebels could never have got control over the region if Russia hadn't been uh, behind them. Um, but somehow Russia more recently destroyed the whole fiction by annexing them. And this undermined their own theory, which is wrong, um, of after on 24th of February last year, uh, the only two possible justification under public international law uh, to use force against another state is either self-defense or Security Council authorization. They obviously didn't have Security Council authorization, so self-defense, well, Ukraine didn't attack Russia, but Russia said yes, but they attacked, and indeed Ukraine used uh, from time to time force against what Russia constructed as the independent republics of Donetsk and Luhansk. But that doesn't work because uh, these were not states. And therefore, there is nothing like collective self-defense for the benefit of an entity which is not a state. Then Russia, and this is the risk in public international law when you make new theories, and I will come back to new theories, why they are dangerous. Uh, Russia invoked also a theory of Canadian origin, the responsibility to protect, in my view, the responsibility to protect is very important, but can never justify the use of force against another state. But it was invoked ex post to justify the NATO intervention in uh, Kosovo, and Putin used it and said, well, we have to protect these people in the Donbass, the uh, Russian ethnic Ukrainians in the Donbass. And obviously, uh, he didn't make a vote among them. And uh, the result was the opposite of what he wanted, because these people are today have become, thanks to his invasion, uh, most of them uh, very pro-Ukrainian. Um, and, and this is why, please be careful with the term genocide. He also invoked the, the term genocide. He claimed that the Ukrainians committed genocide against the inhabitants of Donbass, and therefore he has an obligation to intervene. First of all, this can, even genocide, sorry, cannot justify the use of force against another state. And second, and here Ukraine was very good because, you know, normally in public international law, you cannot go to the International Court of Justice, except if both sides agree, we submit this to the International Court of Justice. And nearly never both sides agree, also because one side knows that probably it will lose the case. But under the Genocide Convention, there's an exception. And so Ukraine said, you put in, you say we commit genocide. We have a dispute over the concept of genocide. Let the International Court of Justice decide that, because we say we don't commit genocide, but you commit genocide. And this is why the case is now before the International Court of Justice. Technically, it's an interpretation of the uh, UN Convention against uh, genocide. So no possible justification. Um, and you will say, OK, but nothing happened. No, please don't say nothing happened. Um, never since the Second World War, there has been such a strong reaction to an aggression because, sorry, I'm not a historian, so I will not make you the list of aggressions which happened since the Second World War. Uh, but I would say this reinforces very much the prohibition of the use of force because everyone, you know, a dictator or a democracy, even democracies sometimes 
engage in aggression, the US against Spain in the Cuba war, for instance, um, the US was a democracy and they clearly attacked Spain. Um, but uh, no one, in my view, no one reasonable will in the future likely attack another state after the experience of what happened to Russia, which is a nuclear power and a great power, but uh, at least all Western states and North American states reacted very forcefully to that. And so even if the situation is legally different about Taiwan, uh, if you have a question, I can discuss that. Uh, even the Chinese will hesitate after what they have seen because the expectation of Putin was they will make some declarations, some little sanctions, but not really react. And they all reacted totally in conformity with public international law because there's not only a right to self-defense, but also a right to collective self-defense. So if Ukraine asks, all the other states under international law have the right to either intervene, which fortunately they didn't do because uh, Russia has nuclear weapons, or to help Russia in any way they uh, consider appropriate. Now, the collective security system envisaged by the UN Charter uh, has suffered a lot uh, because the idea was, and this is not only, uh, now everyone speaks about Russian vetoes, you know, there were also American vetoes protecting Israel against a majority vote condemning Israel. And so the idea that the great powers must have a, a veto was fundamental in this system, and this system has somehow collapsed. And it has shown that it doesn't work. And so we come back to, a, I would say, older uh, part of public international law, which is self-defense and collective self-defense. OK, that was easy. And at least in public international law, really, and I'm a, you will see I'm a very nuanced person, but under the UN Charter, there's no possible justification for the Russian aggression. Now we come to something totally different, which is international humanitarian law. Because under international law, there are not only rules prohibiting war, but also rules applicable how to conduct a war. And uh, these rules are the same for the aggressor and for the state fighting in self-defense, and the use ad bellum, the prohibition of the use of force, and the use in bellum, the humanitarian law, must be kept totally separate. This is impossible to accept for all those involved in a war. My first war, I was delegate of the International Committee of the Red Cross, and for such a delegate, the first war is like a first girlfriend or boyfriend. So was the war between Iran and Iraq, and I was working in Iran, and it is without any doubt that Saddam Hussein's Iraq had attacked Iran. And the Iranian told me always, yes, we love humanitarian law. And obviously humanitarian law is totally in conformity with the Holy Quran. But you know, we were attacked. And I didn't, I was not popular when I said, yes, but I don't care. The humanitarian law rules are the same for those who are attacked and for those who attack. And the Ukrainians cannot accept this and the Palestinians cannot accept it. And the Ethiopians cannot accept it. This is a general phenomenon, nothing new. What is relatively new is that the entire Western uh, nearly entire, 92% Western public opinion cannot either accept it in the case of Ukraine. I experienced that myself in Switzerland when I said once uh, on the radio, as long as Ukraine defends every house in Mariupol, Russia may attack every house. I got a shitstorm 
Although, under humanitarian law, it's totally correct. But, and now I'm more nuanced, I say, as long as Ukraine defends every house in Mariupol, which is, is perfectly justified to do, Russia does not violate humanitarian law if it attacks every house. And people get less nervous by the census, and somehow it's more correct, because obviously any attack by Russia in Ukraine is unlawful because of the use ad bellum, because this was an aggression. But it is essential to keep these two separate, because in every war, no, in nearly all wars, both sides claim that they are right and the other side is wrong. And in all wars, um, those who actually fight will cl claim that. And therefore, if you want to have a minimum of humanity in such an inhumane situation, which is a war, you have to say the same rules apply to both sides. In addition, there is a purely humanitarian consideration, which is simply that the victims of the aggressor need uh, the same protection than the victims, uh, the civilians, by hypothesis, attacked by um, the state fighting in self-defense. And in international law, this is uncontroversial. And even the Nuremberg Tribunal said, obviously, Nazi Germany has not only obligations, but also rights under the laws of war, the same rights than the Allies. But today, this is nearly shitstorm, if you say that. Now, a consequence of this is that also neutral humanitarian action, like that of the International Committee of the Red Cross, is no longer accepted. Um, you know, if you want to protect the Ukrainian prisoners of war in Russia, you have to discuss with Russia. So the president of the ICSC in March last year traveled to Russia, met with Foreign Minister Lavrov, and asked the ICSC in its contacts, is quite transparent organization, this came on the television, and me too, I learned when I worked with the ICSC that you shouldn't give your interlocutor the impression you hate him because you want to have something from him. So he was smiling with Lavrov. Shitstorm, worldwide shitstorm, including the Canadian Red Cross had to say, you know, this is the International Committee, but we, how can you smile with Lavrov? Okay, Zelensky didn't even want to receive him, the ICSC president. And then yesterday we spoke, and I'm very concerned about that, about the mass, the alleged mass deportation of Ukrainians to Russia, which is a very serious violation of humanitarian law, if it is so. But if you are the International Committee of the Red Cross, okay, you can make a statement, as all Ukrainians ask. But if you want to help these people, you have to have access to these people. And Russia claims that these are refugees. And the ICSC, logically, the International Committee of the Red Cross said, okay, these are refugees. Dear Minister Lavrov, we want to open an office in Rostov on the Don who visits these refugees. And Ukraine started a shitstorm against the ICSC, saying that somehow the ICSC condones this war crime because it visits these people. And so unfortunately, you have a a uh, war criminal before you, because in my 13 years with the ICSC, I visited plenty of people who shouldn't have been detained at all. But the idea of the humanitarians is okay, but at least we can inform their families and we can look that they are treated correctly and so on. Another serious challenge for humanitarian law is the impression, which is very widespread, due to this war, more than past wars, that humanitarian law is all the time violated, which is wrong. 
what are the reasons for that? First, because people mix you said Bellum and Yudsen Bellum and they also force say, as Russia attacked Ukraine, necessarily it also violates humanitarian law, which are two different issues. The second reason is that the media, but this is true for all armed conflicts all over the world, the media report about the violations, which is logical. And there are commissions of inquiry, and there's the UN, and there are NGOs. Now imagine Human Rights Watch making a report about the respect of humanitarian law. It's nonsense, which is good because it shows that the normal thing should be the respect. And exceptionally, I mean, uh, the observer of uh, Keluna doesn't either report that yesterday uh, 50,000 drivers drove by respecting the traffic laws uh, through Kaluna, but they will report of the two cases of people driving uh, 80 kilometers uh, in the center of Kaluna. Okay, so it's logical and it's legitimate, but for those people who are not in the field, they get the impression that they're only violations. And this is very dangerous for humanitarian law because no one wants to be the only idiot who respects the law, if no one else respects. In our report, we clearly stated that on both sides, there have been violations and there have been respect. But the violations committed by Russia were more systematic and more serious than those committed by Ukraine. So it's very important to stress that there's also respect. I cannot swear to you but I can swear where I worked. Iran, Iraq, even Saddam Hussein respected the Iran, Iranian prisoners of war, more or less. Bosnia, even the Bosnian Serbs respected in many respects humanitarian law. And in Gaza, there was on both sides, Israeli and Palestinian side also many examples of respect of humanitarian law. And this is very, very important for the credibility of humanitarian law. Again, no one wants to be the only idiot who uh, respects the law if anyone, no one else respects it. And then they get the impression that I, as a soldier, I risk my life for something which doesn't really exist. No, it exists. And another challenge is obviously the uh, the fact that somehow you cannot criticize violations of humanitarian law by Ukraine because they are the victims of an aggression, which they are. And so, um, say, okay, to give you some examples of such violations is the treatment of prisoners of war. The UN Human Rights Monitoring Mission has reported on that. The fact that the state which fights for the freedom of the West still does not give access to the ICRC to all prisoners of war and refuses uh, implication of the ICRC when they make exchanges with the Russians, which is very dangerous for the Russian soldiers, because if you are sent back to Putin, Perhaps just as in the after the Second World War, these people will be sent to Siberia or peer. worse. Or when Amnesty International published a report which was not legally totally correct, I agree. A report that Ukrainian forces often put their positions in the middle of the civilian population which is a violation of humanitarian law. And it's not so clear that violation of humanitarian law, but I don't want to make, a, you can study one year at the Geneva Academy of Humanitarian Law. It's so, but they, they got a shit storm. And as Amnesty International is a member organization, a lot of members, including in Canada, they left Amnesty to say, how can you criticize Ukraine? They defend themselves. And Human Rights Watch is not a member organization, so it had no problem to criticize uh, Ukraine for using the little uh, uh, anti 
personal landmines which they distribute. And there are again, many people, including Ukraine, said, well, we will discuss about humanitarian law once we have finished this war. For the time being, we have to defend ourselves. Well, humanitarian law is precisely there uh, uh, for that purpose. So these are uh, quite challenging. Also, the fundamental misunderstanding of humanitarian law, like every house destroyed, every civilian killed, is perceived as a proof of a violation of humanitarian law which it is not in the conduct of hostilities. You would need to know what was in this house, what was the plan of the Russians, what was the plan of the Ukrainians. And armed forces all over the world, they don't tell you such things. You know, in this commission of inquiry, where I was, Ukraine cooperated a lot with us. But the military didn't want to speak with me because they, they knew obviously what I will ask them. What was in this house? What was in this building which was destroyed? Where were you a position? And the military will not tell you. Okay, perhaps as there is little time left, I would nevertheless finish with some words of optimism that this conflict uh, gives hope for humanitarian law. Western states have invoked humanitarian law, much more humanitarian interpretations of humanitarian law than pre against Russia than previously before this conflict. For instance, the ICRC has fought for many years in favor of a limitation or, if possible, prohibition of the use of explosive weapons with a wide area effect in densely populated areas. And the Americans and the Canadians and the Australians and the British were against. And then the Russians used such weapons, artillery. And suddenly those states were many much more positive and they even signed not a compulsory a declaration, an Irish initiative to say that we have to be particularly careful if we do. We would never have got that if there hadn't been, they criticized Russia, so they cannot now say yes, but we may do it. And the same thing is about class domination. You know, when I didn't believe my ears, when I heard the NATO Secretary General saying Russia uses banned weapons, cluster munitions. Okay, Canada is a party to the Oslo Convention and it's prohibited, but the US is not a party, Ukraine is not a party, and Russia is not a party. So this is progress, because next time when the Israelis use cluster munitions, they cannot say, yes, this is different. And on many other issues, uh, there is such hope, for instance, how seriously states take their obligation to ensure respect by Russia. I mean, a lot of these sanctions were also triggered by Russian violations of humanitarian law. And finally, and I will finish with that, uh, the fight against impunity has got an incredible uh, push forward with the war in Ukraine. First, on the national level, this yesterday we have heard it. Uh, the Ukrainian prosecutor has 65,000 cases. This is absolutely unprecedented, and believe me, it's not the, the number of violations, but that during a war there are already inquiries on violations. Okay, the former prosecutor, Mrs. Venediktova, told us officially there is no case against Ukrainians. Fortunately, the new prosecutor has also opened some cases against Ukrainians because as a prosecutor, obviously it's easier to it's easier, not politically, but technically, uh, to make a prosecution against people who are in my power and who are my own people than for enemies. Third states, universal jurisdiction uh, for war crimes, there exists universal jurisdiction. All states in the world have jurisdiction to try them. 
And this was previously largely a dream. And now, at least in North America and uh, Europe, more in Europe than North America, uh, they take it very serious. Even the Swiss general prosecutor has opened a task force on Ukraine, although he will not find many suspects because, you know, we have mainly Ukrainian women and children, and I trust that they don't violate, they didn't commit war crimes. Uh, so, but they can be witnesses. They can be victims who can give information. And there are a lot of efforts in Europe to do that. Um, and I think in Canada also, they contribute to that. Um, the US is still skeptical about universal jurisdiction because it could also fall on US soldiers, obviously. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Well, and the International Criminal Court, you know, the International Criminal Court was seen as a threat to the US. And now the US has become a fan of the International Criminal Court. This is good news because that's the force of law that once you say we are in favor of fighting impunity, you cannot next time say yes, but when it's about us, we don't. Because as you say in Italian, la legge uguale per tutti. The law is the same for all. That's the force of law. Just, I forgot one point. You allow me just one point, which should be taken into account um, when we discuss which is a threat for humanitarian law. In the global south, I experienced that with my students coming from the global south. As soon as they come from Turkey, from the Middle East, from Africa, from India, they consider, yes, it's terrible what happens in Ukraine, but somehow, there are double standards with humanitarian law, which reinforces the erroneous idea that humanitarian law is something made by Westerners to protect Westerners. While, unfortunately, I must tell you that last year in Ethiopia, there were eight times more civilians killed than in Ukraine and largely no one cares, and Yemen, and so on. So uh, I think I'd put it positively and say, telling them, look, once this war is over, you can say, are you racist? Or why, if my face is black, uh, there is no need to fight impunity? It's the precedent. Also, the Yugoslavia tribunal was only created for Yugoslavia. Mm. But then when there was a genocide in Rwanda, they couldn't say, OK, if these are people from Africa, we don't care. No, they had to create a tribunal. So we have to start somewhere. And I think this is a good starting point to fight impunity. Thank you. Well, thank you, Marco. In light of what you just presented, may I, may I suggest the title, International Law, Twist Turns in Shitstorms. <laughs> so we've had three wonderful presentations, lots of rich fodder to discuss as a group. And so now it's the Q&A time. I'd like to welcome our speakers actually to sit up front, if you don't mind. Um, so for those of you in the audience, if you are interested in asking a question, please try to catch my attention. I will direct our microphone passers to you. We're going to alternate between the floor and Zoom, if possible, um, depending on how many questions we have. And uh, just a reminder that if you want a specific person to answer, specifically if you want Seva to answer a question, you should uh, sort of um, note that in your question so that he can respond because there is a bit of a lag between us live here and him being live streamed over. So with that, um, I do see a hand right here. So we'll take our first question from the floor. Um, yes, please. Also, if you could say your, mm -hmm. your name and uh, you know, your, your, reason, you know, your affiliation, that'd be great. So we know who you are. Um, uh, hello, 
my name is Ilyas. I uh, am a master's student in sustainability program. Uh, firstly, uh, many, many thanks for this wonderful presentation. Uh, presentations. Uh, they were super, uh, super interesting. I hope uh, I won't take too much time because I don't have a lot of questions. Uh, firstly, I think um, uh, the presentation that uh, 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 Professor Marco gave, I think, is uh, somehow uh, very well contradicts to the previous presentation in a way that uh, we have been uh, discussing that, like, uh, Russian invasion has been an example for the world that invading other countries is kind of not very beneficial and costs a lot. So in the future, probably people won't be invading. And I think uh, uh, you have very well shown that no, people will probably continue invading because there is no objective reason to not. And I think the case of Ukraine, as you say, is because your face is white and it is because it undermines or jeopardizes the US hegemony and perhaps that is the only reason. So unless uh, that was kind of my um, uh, challenge, perhaps, if I can put it that way. Um, and just as a quick uh, um, uh, thing to, uh, to to ask, like, uh, do you think that, I guess, uh, 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 Professor uh, Konitsky, maybe it might be an interesting uh, question for you to answer. Uh, we, we're talking about Ukrainian case and how uh, Europe and uh, Central uh, international uh, community have been reacting so like actively with uh, sanctions and all of the things. And I'm just curious, like why we haven't acted the same way with Georgia? Because I think when 20% uh, when of Georgian land was uh, and is still uh, occupied by Russia. We have been like, okay, we're going to talk. We need to talk, we take a sit and talk, and let's kind of stop it and come to peace and all of the things. While here, we are just trying to disintegrate Russia as much as we can, leaving no instruments for us to have any in influence on it by leaving the markets, not buying gas. So it is truly an independent country. Um, and here, I think I also want to kind of. Uh, uh, flow out from this question another question is that uh, um, do you think it is the uh, one of the reasons is that uh, there is not enough uh, strong uh, leaders in uh, and I think I'm sounding like a Hungarian president but do you think it is because there is not a strong leaders in Europe as it used to be before we don't have uh, Merkel anymore I mean that is the case I don't know and the last question perhaps is that sorry, uh, sorry just in the interest of time I'm sorry to cut you off but maybe we'll answer your first okay, round of questions okay, cool, and you can cool, come back okay. we'll come back to you yeah okay so Merci. Oh, thank you Uh, well, very shortly, I agree with you about the double standards, but again, I insist it's not the rhetoric what I do, but I think we have to start somewhere. And we started with Yugoslavia, this was a double standard. I worked in the former Yugoslavia, a lot of people said, why do they do it with us and not with other? But it was a starting point which then allowed the constitution of the International Criminal Court, which would ideally have jurisdiction everywhere. Georgia, you are absolutely right. By the way, even, and this is serious, the International Criminal Court has double standards because it took the International Criminal Court 14 years to indict the first person, it has jurisdiction because Georgia, unlike Ukraine, is a party to the statute. Uh, Ukraine has accepted the jurisdiction, but not is not a party. Um, it took it 14 years, the prosecutor, while now on Ukraine, the prosecutor gives the impression that uh, he will, uh, within uh, the next two months indict the first person. Hmm, I have great doubts. And it is also true that uh, even if you hate Russia, you must admit it is astonishing how the same conduct in Syria 
provoked very little uh, international reaction. When it comes to humanitarian law, huh? because you know, obviously Syria is a non-international armed conflict, so there's no aggression in Syria. So the difference is under the UN Charter is big. But when it comes to humanitarian law, I mean, the Russians applied the same tactics in Syria and in Ukraine. And there was very little uh, international reaction. By NGOs, yes. By governments, nearly nothing. Astonishing. Now, obviously, I don't have to speak for him and for him, but the difference, I spoke as a lawyer, the difference is that at the time of Georgia, um, the Western states still had the hope we can make a deal with the Russians and we shouldn't antagonize the Russians. As pre the French president Sarkozy, when he made, which no one uh, tries today, um, he succeeded to make a deal uh, on a ceasefire in Georgia. And uh, he said, well, as Isaac Rabin said once in Israel, we have to negotiate with our enemies, not with our friends, and we have to find, uh, and Russia is present in Europe, and we cannot simply eradicate Russia. And therefore, I, they, at the time, there was still the hope, also I agree with the analysis that the thought of Putin was exactly the same uh, in Georgia, uh, somehow there was still a hope from the West, uh, let's not antagonize him too much. At the end, we have to live with them. Thank you. And by the way, we don't disagree, because I agree with his analysis, but simply I come from another field, if I may say. Yeah, just let me make up, you're just working, a brief comment about um, the way in which this war may rearrange uh, global uh, alliances, because obviously the BRICs are uh, not enthusiastic about this war. And uh, so most of the world, or at least if they, as that they represent, is not enthusiastic about this war. And China has just recently put out a 12-point uh, peace proposal. Uh, so it's emerging as a kind of offshore balancer itself, which is a new role. And uh, uh, a lot of people are saying, well, look, uh, because of the success of Russia and sustaining itself despite these sanctions, maybe we're looking at a big realignment of uh, uh, the balance of power. And if that's true, then uh, you would have to regard the NATO policy as uh, uh, self-defeating in the long run. And most of these countries are much more afraid of NATO and intervention than they are of uh, um, a conflict, uh, a sort of ethnic conflict in uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, thanks, I'll just add a couple of things very quickly. Um, I, I, just on that last point, I don't see really as much of a major realignment away from the West, at least in the short term, the invasion galvanized the West uh, to such an extent that it surprised Putin. Uh, it really allowed Europe to start emerging as, a, as an actor, although it is still a ways to go. Uh, so Putin has always said he wanted a multipolar world, and in a way he's kind of achieved that by uh, the, the emergence of, I would say, the, the tenuous emergence of Europe as, as an actor in foreign policy. Now, as to why, <clears throat> why Ukraine has received a disproportionate amount of attention, I think is a fascinating and complex question. I think, of course, race has to be a part of it. The Ukrainians are white. Uh, on social media, they look just like uh, white people in the West. And, uh, and I think that does um, you know, figure into the equation. Uh, there's also the fact that it's a land war in Europe, as opposed to Georgia, which Georgia, to the extent that it exists in the minds of Westerners exist in some exotic faraway land somewhere in the mountains, whereas Ukraine is firmly, more firmly placed in Europe. <clears throat> it may also have simply been a tipping point when it comes to reaction to Russian behavior, uh, because after all, Ukraine in 2014 uh, did not receive nearly as much attention from the West, even though it was also 
white and in Europe. So perhaps it had more to do with Russian behavior than with the particularities of the country uh, being invaded. Uh, and plus, not to mention, we should not discount the fact that there is a clear aggressor here. There is a sort of uh, moral clarity that is uh, rare in conflicts. And not to mention the David versus Goliath story, which people love, uh, where a seemingly smaller opponent has managed to overcome uh, a bully, right? So that it has universal themes that uh, resonate with people. And that's part of the reason why um, the, the Ukrainian conflict has captured uh, the news cycle more than other conflicts that have been you know, equally uh, devastating. Uh, so as, as to whether that will continue, I think it really does have to do with the military situation. And I think that's why a war of attrition uh, favors Russia, uh, because it over the long term, it is counting on attention to fade from the West, both at the public and the elite level. Uh, and Putin is, you know, settled in settled for a long war. Uh, and he sees that as a uh, in, in the long term, an advantage for Russia. Uh, we'll see if that's true. Ho hopefully not the case. I'll stop there. Question. Am I going to take my moderator's prerogative here? I mean, so I'm an international relations scholar, and you all said some really interesting things about potential realignment and multipolarity. And I think one of the things I was thinking of as, as Seva was talking in particular is you have the post-World War II world. You set up the UN and various other multilateral institutions. This is supposed to be some sort of multipolarity, right? But at the same time, you immediately, the world plunges into, or nearly immediately, the world plunges into the Cold War, which creates a bipolar system. And now we have the sort of fading of that, possibly, and the rise of many other actors. So my question is, how is this going to, what, what is the future of international law, given this contradiction has always been with us? But if, you know, if what Seva says is right, um, you know, you have the emergence of Europe as a potential other pole, um, as well as the other BRICS countries that you all brought up, wh what's going to happen? What, do we have any thoughts about, especially international law, but also just thinking about the way power is distributed globally? Um, maybe we'll go in reverse order. So we'll go back to you, Seva, and then Stephen Marco. Well, well, since this is a great question, but since this is a question about international law, I will happily defer to my two co-panelists. And if there's something that I feel jumps out at me, I'm happy to contribute a little bit at the end, but I'm happy to listen for now. Think about that. Okay, Stephen. Yeah, well, I, I hesitate to speak on international law, but in terms of uh, uh, problems of multipolarity and bipolarity and balance of power, uh, bipolarity is more stable and therefore more peaceful. Uh, it has lots of little wars in between, but not big wars. And uh, if, if we emerge into a situation of genuine multipolarity, which I don't think is going to happen, uh, uh, it would be an unstable situation. My suspicion is that uh, the rise of Europe is uh, um, very iffy and temporary, and their willingness to actually commit to uh, what would be necessary to be great player in this uh, uh, emerge, whatever the emerging balance of power is, is it's just not there. And uh, um, it's very unlikely that this will uh, uh, change. There, it, certainly uh, for this particular conflict, there is uh, a certain amount of agreement. But, but if you look at what is actually being contributed uh, it's not all that dramatic. It's, it's uh, mostly symbolic. And uh, um, I wish that wasn't the case, but uh, um, I think that is a, a more realistic analysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Marco. Well, international law is, um, I think, uh, is, has a better role in a multipolar world than, uh, than in a uh, bipolar world, but uh, it can exist in both. Uh, in a unipolar world, indeed, it has difficulties. You know, at least in Europe, when there was a Roman Empire, there was no international law. There was Roman law about, and the use gentium was the law of Rome for the non-Romans. That's so that's a problem, unipolar world. Well, 
Multipolar world, well, I'm obviously convinced by deformation professionnelle that it is precisely through law that we have a better chance, and particular smaller countries. And that was always the belief of Canada and was the belief of Switzerland that we have a better chance to get something through law. And this is why both countries were very much in favor of international law. And again, I am not sure that the international law has not rather been strengthened, uh, the prohibition of the use of force with the international reaction. It, because you know, obviously, especially in the humanitarian field, I see the double standard issue and so on. But uh, nevertheless, no one obliged these states not to vote for Russia or at least to abstain in the UN General Assembly. And most of them did not. So I think there is also obviously uh, Liechtenstein, the Cap Verdean Islands, and uh, Burkina Faso have the same vote than China. That's an interesting point. And China is genuinely neutral. And uh, India, somehow, nevertheless, the largest democracy in the world has uh, uh, somehow simply says, don't exaggerate about this. Uh, it's not such a big thing, which is also partly true in the sense, you know, I, I in Switzerland now we have a big discussion about neutrality and I always tell them, okay, let's abandon neutrality, but don't do it because of the Ukraine war, because it's not the first war and it's not the last war and it's not the law, sorry for the victims not the most terrible war. It is one of the clearest aggression. I agree with that. Also, when we analyze seriously, I mean, Saddam Hussein attacked Iran and uh, Eritrea attacked Ethiopia. And there's no doubt, no controversy how today about it, but no one cared. So even on the use ad bellum issue. But as I said, on the use ad bellum, I'm rather optimistic. Humanitarian law has this fundamental challenge that if we don't get the message through that both sides have to respect humanitarian law, then it is in a very difficult situation because the next time there's an armed conflict, you can be absolutely sure that both time to both sides claim that they are right. And then we have no more humanitarian law because if the rules are not the same, if we cannot say, okay, we don't care. Again, the Iranians were very offended when I said, I don't care. But that was my job, not to care about who is right and who is wrong, but about the victims. And obviously, an additional complication in this war when it comes to humanitarian law is Simply one side has much more occasions to violate than the other. It's somehow like in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Obviously the Israelis commit more violations because they occupy and they bomb Gaza and so on. And sometimes Hamas bombs Israel and then it's, it's also a violation. So as Ukraine, rightly so, doesn't fight on Russian territory, except the prisoners of war on whom I insist very much. Uh, Russian civilians don't suffer from Ukrainian attacks, so it is unilateral. And therefore, it is somehow natural that there are more violations committed by Russia than by Ukraine. And Ukraine doesn't occupy parts of Russia, and therefore there's no occupied territory, and therefore they don't even have an occasion to violate the law of occupation. Thank you. Um, let's turn it over to the Zoom questions. A little bit. Little so bit. one of our online guests points to some YouTube videos that, in their opinion, strongly implicates Russia in some hum human rights violations and wonders where the human rights um, defenders are. But that, I'm going to change that a little bit and wonder what, if anything, does modern social media change in these type of international conflicts and the way that 
uh, the political decision makers and leaders and the public interact. So any any thoughts on that? So do, you, do I, Seva, do you actually want to speak to that? Because you, you are a frequent commentator on social media on these issues and maybe, and you've thought about this in, in academic writing. Um, well, if, if the question is the role of social media in, in how it impacts our perception of um, international law or human rights violations, is that the question? Well, some of the conversation has been around the role of international governments or national governments in deciding and proceeding with conflicts like war. And this is now in the modern era, the public information or, or very much managed information. But is this changing things or has there always been a substantial manipulation of the message in order to maintain the public support? Um, I'll, I'll say very briefly because I've written on Russian disinformation before. Um, you know, there was this expectation that Russians are masters of disinfo uh, after the election, et cetera. And we saw a kind of a failure of uh, Russian attempts to control public discourse around the war, at least in the opening months of the war. And I think the simple conclusion from that is it's much easier to try to disrupt narratives of others through social media and through other means than to try to build up your own narrative. So uh, with the Skripal poisoning a few years ago, I don't know if you recall when a uh, former spy was, um, uh, there was an attempt on his life. The Russian government produced something like 20 different explanations. And this is what Russians call shroom, info noise, just noise, throwing explanations at the wall. And that's very easy for seeding doubt when you want to disrupt hegemonic narratives. I think it's less effective when it comes to uh, building up your own. And I think in that sense, Russia and Russian media strategy, if you want to call it that, has been less successful, at least for the uh, foreign market. Uh, it, it remains to be seen how effective uh, it is for the domestic market. The Russian propaganda is uh, obviously increased a lot. And if you watch Russian TV, which I do occasionally, I don't recommend it very much. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's pretty uh, straightforwardly propaganda. I'm not, it's not clear how much of an impact it really has on the younger population. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll stop there on the effect of propaganda and uh, social media. I'm sure there's much more to be said. Thank you, Stephen. You want to speak to this? Yeah, I just wanted to add a kind of minor historical footnote <clears throat> that in the run-up to World War II, there was a very strong effort uh, by uh, voluntary organizations in the U.S. to protect people from propaganda. And one of the major points that they made, since they were learning the lessons from World War I, is don't believe those atrocity stories. Uh, they are uh, one-sided, uh, partly made up and incomplete. Uh, so they looked at, they wanted people to be very skeptical about particular kinds of propaganda. And this may have contributed to the failure to uh, appreciate the Holocaust. Yet uh, there is an important point here that uh, uh, citizens uh, need to be able to um, filter uh, information. And that's something that's becoming much more difficult in the uh, global uh, uh, media system, which is why there is so much uh, effort at controlling this through uh, these uh, uh, dis disinformation protocols and uh, what uh, Obama called curation, the idea that what the public sees has to be managed. And uh, that, that, I think, is an even more dangerous notion than uh, um, being skeptical about uh, uh, all propaganda. But it really shifts the whole issue of uh, democratic control in a very dramatic way. If what we receive is something that is manipulated in the first place, you really have to ask the question of oh, who's doing the manipulation, raises all of these problems of discretionary power, uh, bias and so on. And I think that's actually one of the more serious problems uh, uh, facing us. Marco? Yeah, thank you. Well, I already mentioned the shitstorms. 
um, which is a new phenomenon. You know, I worked a lot of the, on the Middle East conflict, which is very polarized. But also we have large uh, Jewish and Palestinian communities in Switzerland. I never got a shitstorm because there was no sh possibility to have a shitstorm. And you know, a shitstorm against someone who tries to be neutral in a conflict. Neutrality is an offense today. And this, the Palestinians and the Israelis, they have accepted that people don't necessarily take a uh, position. Now, I think uh, the social media have also facilitated, nevertheless, the finding of violations. For instance, our commission found a lot of violations by Russia and by Ukraine, thanks to, you know, those who commit crimes, which is not a good sign, they put it on Facebook. Oh, yeah. And so you can see it, where our Ukrainian soldier uh, shoots in the legs of a Russian prisoner or a prisoner of war. Obviously, you have to check whether this is really Russian and this is really Ukrainian, but we were able to do that and so on. I would say the Russians are very bad in propaganda, at least in the humanitarian field. You know, I mean, when, I mean, there are explanations about when they bomb something is very bad. The Israelis and the Americans, when they bomb in Iraq, Afghanistan, and so, they say, first, we make an inquiry. Second, they explain, the Israelis say, this large apartment building which we destroyed and 15 civilians were killed, there was a command and control center by Hamas there. Who can check that? Hmm? But they have good intelligence and so on. While the Russians, it's ridiculous. They say, it was not us, but it was the Ukrainians themselves who attacked. <laughs> For instance, the Kramatorsk uh, train station, where they could, without any problem, have said, well, this was a strategic target because there was, and the railways in Ukraine are strategic targets because most of the supplies go over railways. And okay, then proportionality we will discuss, but we claim, as the Americans claim, this was very important to interrupt this at this place. And then who knows, and so on. Well, they are very bad. Um, the Ukrainians are very good. And they really control the public discourse. Um, the government, I mean, you know, there was an advisor of President Zelensky who made just the hypothesis, which in every war is happening, that uh, some of the people of an attack were killed because of their own defense. Not deliberately, obviously, but accidentally. He had immediately to resign. So there's, the discourse must be, we are the victims, and those are the people who. And I think this contributes greatly to the international sympathy. And don't misunderstand me, I think to 85% correctly so uh, to uh, Ukraine. And this is why they don't like things like Amnesty International claiming that uh, they, uh, I don't know whether you are familiar with this, you know, Amnesty International made a report that they, uh, that Ukraine is positioning their uh, military positions in midst of the civilian population. And this was very much fought against by all those who are in favor of Ukraine, because it indirectly also would confirm that the Russians do not deliberately attack the civilians, but because otherwise, I mean, if it was true, what is the general discourse, that the Russians don't care, they the attack indiscriminately, it would be totally useless that the Ukrainians put themselves in the midst of the civilians because anyway the Russians want to attack the civilians. So this, they understood very well that this is very dangerous for the Ukrainian. It mean that the Russians, okay, they kill, uh, they kill civilians, but not because they want to kill civilians, but because they want to attack Ukrainian soldiers. So, 
Um, well, I would say the, the jury is out on social media, but it can have positive and it can have negative effects. But anyway, they exist, and so we have to live with that. Uh, and propaganda was in every war an important uh, factor. And more recently, perhaps because fortunately, uh, people are more concerned about humanitarian problems. To claim that the enemy commits war crimes is a very important argument, reinforcing international sympathy for you and diminishing sympathy for the enemy. And this is why the Palestinians, they make every day a statement about Israel violating the Fort Geneva Convention. I mean, because it's one of their only chances to get international attention. If they make a statement saying, we want to have a Palestinian state, um, very few people care about. But when they say, oh, the Israelis killed a journalist, then... Okay, thank you. Um, I'm looking at the time, and I get in trouble if we go over even by a second. So I'm going to take one last question from the floor, if there are any questions. I, I saw his hand first. So go ahead. Yes. And everyone just so we're mindful of a couple minutes each response if, yeah. All right. Thank you very much. I'll make it very, very brief. Uh, I do a lot of reading, but <laughs> uh, I'm still unclear as to back in 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea, you see different figures, statistics. What, what percentage of the people living in Crimea in, in 2014 were actually sympathetic to Russia and wanted to become part of Russia? And the second part of the question, in the Donbass, in those areas that Russia claims, you know, the referendum, oh, they want to be what part. What percentage of people, can we get through the fog, what percentage of people living in the those two areas of Eastern Ukraine are actually sympathetic to Russia? Okay, yeah. I can speak uh, on that briefly. I have Marco or Seva question. Marco? Yeah. Well, you know, my answer is for international law, it doesn't matter, because even if they were sympathetic, uh, I mean, even if the inhabitants of British Columbia were sympathetic to the U.S., it would be prohibited to the U.S. to uh, annex British Columbia. But obviously, politically and in international relations, it's a very important question. To the best of my knowledge, in Crimea, the, uh, the vote they organized was Martin manipulated, but Many people, also for historical reasons, uh, were sympathetic uh, to Russia. But it doesn't matter. You cannot annex that. It really doesn't matter. And then in the Donbass, I think what Putin did was totally counterproductive, because to the best of my knowledge, in 1415, uh, there were a lot of people who had sympathy with Russia, and today they have no more sympathy with Russia. So, but I couldn't give percentages. Perhaps my colleagues have something. Yeah, I think, Seva, you want to jump in here? Uh, yeah, just real quick. I mean, um, the person asking wants to cut through the fog, and that would be nice, but we cannot cut through the fog because there's war. You, simply put, you, you cannot hold a referendum in an occupied territory to determine the level of support for an occupation when the majority of that population has been violently displaced or killed by that very same occupation. And that's why these uh, Elon Musk type proposals to, well, let's just, let's just figure out what people really want on the ground are so ridiculous because at this point, the situation on the ground has been uh, altered radically by the occupation itself. Uh, and so uh, th there's no simple answer there. Um, Stephen, you, you're... It's you not unique, that? Western Sahara and Morocco. We could make the same statement. Yeah, I, I'm certainly not an expert on this, but my understanding is that the original ethnic uh, Tatar um, ethnicity in Crimea was long since displaced. And so uh, it was ethnically more Russian than uh, uh, it, it was historically. So there wasn't... Uh, um, 
as much opposition or uh, so forth. In that case, that's just a different situation. Well, I, I wanna take this time to thank our, our panelists for giving us so much food for thought. So please join me in thanking them. But I also hope we all leave this room with a little bit of dispelling our, of our assumptions. I think that's one of the, the themes that arose out of the three, the three speakers' comments today. So um, thank you so much for, for giving us more to think about in this very important and yet still developing situation. Now I'd like to turn things over to my colleague, Adam Jones, who's a professor of political science here, and he'll be speaking next. Thanks, Wendy. It's my task to uh, make some comments to try to draw together some of the discussions that we've been having over the past two days. Um, I think, first of all, it's notable that they have been uh, of a very high quality. I've been very impressed by uh, the presentations that we've listened to, the caliber of the questions and the responses. And I think we have um, made some analytical cuts into this dramatic crisis in a way that brings greater clarity and cohesion to the analysis. I don't have much time so I would like to focus on um, just some fairly minor and peripheral subjects, uh, namely imperialism, war, history, <laughs> democracy, human rights, justice, and international law. I can probably devote about 15 seconds to each of those. Um, one of the one of the kind of vibes that has emerged from the discussions especially yesterday is a, a still a bit of a sense of surrealness and disbelief of at what we have witnessed over the last year um a sense that certain ghosts or vestiges of the past that we thought were consigned to the past are now um, resurgent and sometimes in ways that seem almost surreally ahistorical a or parallel to events a very long time ago. I've been teaching my course on Russia and Eastern European politics both last year and this year, and it has really been um, striking to pursue this kind of subject uh, day by day and see the kind of large scale transformations that have been emerging. Um, one of those trans some of those transformations are rather explicit and obvious, like uh, the uh, impending expansion of NATO, who would have imagined a year or two ago that Sweden and Finland would be urgently knocking on uh, NATO's door, and what uh, Putin must have imagined would have been the consequences of the invasion, namely promoting a disarray in the West and a weakening of NATO, apparently is having uh, the opposite result and also leading, as Dr. Falk was noting yesterday, to transformations within NATO itself. Uh, Professor Yakelchik also mentioned that aspect. Sometimes the impact has been somewhat more subtle and a little harder to discern, as with, for example, the comments that we've heard this morning about emerging multipolarity in the world. It does seem as though um, the sides that are being taken on the Ukraine conflict are speaking to a kind of hardening of the West versus the rest and a kind of balancing, loosely balancing coalition built around the BRIC countries uh, and their supporters. Uh, how that will play out is, of course, extremely difficult to predict, but it does seem a very different type of world order and correspondingly a very different type of discussion uh, 
in a world that is neither uh, unipolar as it was briefly after the Cold War or bipolar as it was during the Cold War, where there is in fact a multiplicity of interests. Um, one of the uh, implications of that, I think, for uh, scholars like myself who have been very attentive to the role of imperialism and power politics in international affairs, we've traditionally tended to configure that, I think, in north-south terms. And our understanding of imperialism, at least among those of us who um, define ourselves or understand uh, the world in kind of progressive terms, quote unquote, has been very much focused on the historical European colonial powers and their post-colonial neo-colonialism and the new imperial actor of the United States and its impact around the world. And sometimes secondary issues such as Israel, Israel and Palestine that kind of map onto that analysis. Um, turns out that imperialism is for more people than just Westerners these days. Imperialism seems to be being democratized partly by this um, uh, emergence of multipolarity. And at the same time as we are focusing now on a rather traditional expression of Russian imperialism vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, we're also asking questions about China in Taiwan and Eritrea in Ethiopia and sources of that kind of aggressive and expansionist and conquering mentality that don't neatly fit with our traditional imperialist and anti-imperialist framings. Um, so perhaps that discussion is becoming more nuanced in this multipolar world. With regard to war and war making, again, there is this surreal dimension that I've experienced of teaching students about the Nazi Soviet war and the politics of memory surrounding it. And meanwhile, the daily news reports are of artillery sieges and tank campaigns and trench warfare and uh, very much kind of um, reminiscent of the classic battles of the Second World War, which of course have become a foundation for Russian collective memory, nationalism, patriotism, the victory myth around the great patriotic war and so on. So that kind of um, uh, ahistorical uh, eruption of traditional style war when our focus as scholars of politics and IR and war in recent decades has been much more focused on things like hybrid war or asymmetric war or the new face of war in the global south. It turns out that uh, some of the more familiar and traditional visages of war have not gone away. Um, and one of the aspects of this model of war making that is distinct from some of the more uh, contemporary framings is the sheer um, resource aspect of it. Um, how incredibly costly and wasteful of resources is this type of war that we are seeing in Ukraine? And surely one of the questions that we have to ask about likely outcomes down the line is which side, broadly speaking, Russia and its allies versus Ukraine and its allies is best going to be able to manage and win that war, on, war of production. Uh, and there are some disturbing indications already arising of stockpiles being depleted in the West and very serious questions developing of, okay, if we are committed, what is this going to mean in terms of retooling our productive economies in order to bolster military spending and also bolster arms production for Ukraine? Um, and that all of those issues with all of the 
um, flavor of the military industrial complex that they bring up are now resurgent and progressives find themselves in the rather unusual and sometimes uncomfortable position of urging Western military industrial complexes to ramp up so that Ukraine can be more effectively defended. Um, is that a decision we're going to make? And it's, of course, a decision that countries like Canada and all of the European nations are going to have to address in coming years. It's going to be reflected in budgets, in economic decisions, in the role of the state, um, as uh, uh, in the commanding heights of the economy and so on. Um, we are seeing a resurgence of uh, what Dr. Falk yesterday referred to as the Russian way of war, um, a very uh, resource intensive, uh, life intensive, um, grinding approach to conflict um, envisaging a long war in which the more um, the power with the greater endurance will emerge victorious. And of course, we have seen the return of the um, figure, uh, the threat of nuclear war and something that had largely retreated to the sidelines of the international system and was seen as a real outlier in terms of war making strategies is now um, a back front and center and again surreally we are having rather casual conversations about do you think the russians will use tactical nukes in ukraine uh, what was until relatively recently relatively unthinkable is rapidly becoming relatively thinkable again with uh, unforeseeable consequences um, with regard to history I think one of the themes that we have seen repeatedly over the course of these sessions is that history matters, uh, but also that history is plastic and constantly being revisited, reinterpreted, reformulated primarily to suit political expediencies of the day, uh, whether we talk of leaders or populations. And the struggles over memory uh, of history, um, the struggles over interpretations of history and the legitimacy that history may or may not lend to certain political projects like reestablishing the Russian imperial realm, for example, um, has reminded us uh, that in the words of the old cliche, um, the past is never dead, it isn't even past. It is always being revisited and reformulated for contemporary uh, priorities. And in the case of Ukraine, I think we also see very clearly the role of history in state building and nation building and the construction of the kind of imagined communities that we refer to as societies. Ukraine in the last year has undergone a crash course in nation building and in national unity. And the coalescing around particular models and understandings of historical experience in that part of the world has, as it typically is, uh, been uh, essential to the formulation of that new sense of collective identity and shared historical purpose. Um, questions of democracy and self-determination seem to have been cast into sharp relief by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, I think it is significant that the violation of Ukrainian sovereignty and right to self-determination has provoked a very substantial and sustained and effective response thus far. It is not universal, but it is certainly much greater than Vladimir Putin expected. Uh, it's greater than I expected, frankly, and it is encouraging, as I think Marco Sassoli was indicating in his more optimistic comments. 
to see that this has really provoked a kind of visceral outrage. And I'm glad to see that we are still capable of feeling that, even though our outrage tends to be selective, tends to be culturally conditioned, may even have a racial dimension. As Marco was saying, we do have to start somewhere. And it could very easily have been a very different response of who cares, you know, I've got my own problems. That has not been the response and Canada has been a, a good example of that, I think. Um, so what are the prospects, however, for democracy and self-determination in this um, renewing multipolar world? Uh, can we, in fact, establish a kind of international norm that is persuasive to the bulk of key actors? Or is it increasingly going to be seen as a kind of romantic vestige of Western political philosophy uh, that is increasingly out of step with the power politics of the 21st century? Um, we have also the problem that when Western countries or figures speak about democracy and self-determination, they are doing so against a backdrop of considerable hypocrisy and considerable involvement in the perpetration and violation of sovereignty and self-determination, particularly in the countries of the global south. Uh, what is the moral credibility of the West and its leaders in pronouncing on these themes? Well, I do think it is important to recognize that there are no angels in international affairs and there is no end of hypocrisy in international affairs, but I do think that there is the opportunity for Western supporters of democracy to um, utilize the kind of challenges and crises that have arisen in the Ukraine context to make a renewed case for the necessity of democracy and self-determination and a renewed pledge to support it rather than inhibiting it, as has often been the case in the past. Um, with regard to questions of human rights, we're of course afflicted by the same selectivity and hypocrisy and general laziness in our approach to the global sphere here. So that as has been pointed out this morning, um, Human, humanitarian crises of an even greater order than we are witnessing in Ukraine, such as in Ethiopia or in, in Yemen or in Syria, have typically attracted relatively little outrage, relatively little concerted response by actors who consider themselves the guardians of these values. Um, we, therefore, if we are going to make a human rights and humanitarian based case around the Ukraine war, it is an invitation to us to revisit our standards and to try to apply them more widely and consistently and with less kind of selectivity and inattention. Uh, simply because certain parts and peoples of the world are considered peripheral to our uh, political concerns and moral concerns. Um, we also encounter in regard to the Ukraine conflict, some of the quandaries of uh, supporting and encouraging and enforcing human rights in conflict situations. Once again, there are no angels. And those who, uh, on the one hand, are strongly in support of Ukraine's right to uh, control its own destiny and to uh, preserve its autonomy, um, need to be aware of the fact that in any conflict, both sides will be guilty of violations. 
doesn't mean that there has to be a kind of casual um, uh, rendering of equality between the actors or assigning of equal responsibility. I think it's clear that Russia, partly just by virtue of invasion and occupation, has committed the crimes that we associate with invasion and occupation. But we must be, I think, attentive to the crimes of our friends and um, deeply concerned and uh, determined to ensure that messages get across to those friends that that is not acceptable behavior under any political circumstances or war circumstances, again, as Marco was mentioning, and that investigations of uh, claims by uh, of violence uh, by our side need to receive um, the same kind of attention if the broader humanitarian and human rights values are truly to be expanded and advanced rather than just imposed in a, a newly selective way. I do a lot of work on the subject of uh, genocide and crimes against humanity. And that's those are themes that have arisen pretty substantially in the course of our discussions. I'm constantly getting asked whether I think Ukraine is a case of genocide. I don't particularly want to uh, get into that rather treacherous terrain and, and complex terrain, but it is very notable, uh, once again, the power of that concept in today's world. The fact that states wish to kind of uh, attach it to their experiences of victimization, or, and I, I think this was most notable, uh, the Putin regime's preemptive deployment of a genocide framework, namely being aware that they would be vulnerable to such accusations, presenting themselves instead as acting to prevent or to stop genocide rather than to perpetrate it. And it does at least attest to the enduring kind of cachet of that concept, that invented word by Raphael Lemkin in the 1940s, and the way that it speaks to a particular conception of a crime of crimes, of something that is um, beyond the boundaries of any acceptable human or civilized behavior. Uh, so regardless of how the kind of competing accusations uh, resonate with the international community, the fact that those accusations are being made uh, points to the significance of that concept, the desire of aggressive leaders to avoid having it attached to their own actions, and also to the role of the experience and in this case, arguably the renewed experience of genocide in Ukraine at Russian hands, the way that that in turn becomes part of the collective memory and the collective nation and state building effort that we see underway. So the utility of the concept is as a kind of interpretive and rhetorical device, as well as a body of law. And I think that is likely to be the kind of um, multifaceted identity that the concept of genocide remain, uh, retains going forward. Um, lastly, with regard to prospects for justice and international law, um, I'm again sometimes asked whether we are ever likely to see Vladimir Putin in the dock at The Hague being charged with crimes against humanity or genocide. And you know what? I think it's possible. I don't think it would come about as a result of, you know, sending the Marines into the Kremlin to arrest the guy. But I do think one of the utilities of international law and international justice 
for transitional regimes in particular has been the opportunity to offload and to outsource justice seeking to bodies like the International Criminal Court or the International Court of Justice, sometimes as a way of removing what is still, you know, a politically sensitive figure or movement uh, and translocating it to um, another forum of justice. And one can imagine a scenario whereby an internal opposition would succeed in toppling Putin and then could conceivably turn him over to international law, partly just to get him the hell out of Russia and out of their hair without uh, the um, rather Stalin-esque flavor of putting a bullet in his head. Uh, so that is interesting to imagine. It's probably a little over-optimistic. Um, but it does suggest that there continues to be a powerful push against impunity and for the application of international law even to countries that are hegemonic in their regions or in the global power balance more generally, uh, even in cases where the actual application of international law seems like a very distant prospect, it nonetheless is part of the debate. It is part of the kind of um, toolkit that is being deployed these days against uh, authoritarian, tyrannical, aggressive, genocidal actors. Uh, so regardless of the future of that, I think that um, there is the prospect for an application of at least limited justice here. And I think it's worth noting um, a couple of the more significant transformations over the last several decades in international humanitarian law. A couple of uh, panelists have referred to the question of universal jurisdiction, which I think really erupted into the modern political landscape with the Pinochet case earlier in this century, and has now been, um, in is increasingly understood that there are a certain range of crimes that constitute such a violation of what it means to be human, what we have in common, that justice can also be in common. That is to say that any state potentially is justified in prosecuting anyone for any of those crimes committed in any part of the world. Uh, that is, of course, a revolutionary a concept that is still very much in a state of gestation, but I think it has somewhat strengthened in the last decade or two. And I think that uh, Russia and Ukraine could be an interesting test case for it. The other transformation, and I'll close with this, is the new attention or renewed attention to the crime of aggression. And Aggression is what the Nazis were primarily tried for at Nuremberg. Of course, we didn't have a genocide convention in 1946, 1947. Um, and they were tried exclusively for crimes committed after the outbreak of World War II on September 1st, 1939. So not for any preceding uh, persecution of the Jews, for example. Um, so it was a crime that was well understood that led to a number of people being hanged for it at Nuremberg and then kind of retreated to the margins of international law. And it has now resurged. And I think a lot of people that look at this and look at the ICC's new um, uh, uh, power uh, to uh, investigate and to prosecute for the crime of uh, aggression, the jurisdiction that it now enjoys there. One is likely to uh, speculate, I think, that Russia and Ukraine would be an excellent test case for application of that law, precisely because even though the humanitarian consequences 
have not been as devastating in, as in some other parts of the world. The act of aggression is unusually clear and explicit and widely recognized. And so as we move forward and justice seeking for this war and the atrocities associated with it, um, hopefully continues to be pursued, one could expect to see it becoming uh, a notable example for some of these cutting edge innovations or revisions of international law. And uh, certainly I think most of us here would uh, hope uh, to see that expanded toolkit of international law and humanitarian law applied in this case and in many others. So I'll conclude with that and thank you again for your uh, attention and contributions to the sessions over the last couple of days. I'll turn it over to Manuel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Jones. Um, it is my utmost pleasure uh, to conclude the meetings of the Roger W. Gale Symposium with thanks. Um, and I have very many people to thank. Uh, first of all, Marcos Assoli, Stephen Turner, Halina Sapena, Sapeha, uh, Serhi Akelchik, Seva Gunitsky, um, and I shouldn't forget Norman, Professor Norman Neimark um, from last night's uh, talk, as well as Barbara J. Falk, who is now sitting over there. So all the guest speakers who have contributed. Then the organizing team on, on, on campus, um, Liana Knezevich and Perla Villegas. Ideas. Um, to thank again Roger Gale for his brilliant idea of organizing interdisciplinary symposia and, and organizing them through EPP. And last, because it's the most important, to thank Helen. Helen Yanakopoulos, who deserves a round of applause. <laughs> well done.